30, so it's time to kick things off. Thank you all for joining me this evening for December's edition of these LVS film reading sessions. A very Merry Christmas to everyone. Now, we're having this session a little early because of the Christmas and New Year festivities, but we do have four interesting cases to review. So for those of you who are new to these sessions, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the RVC in 2004. I got my imaging certificate uh, in 2009 and I got my uh, diploma um, in 2018. And these days you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in London. And if I can be of any assistance to you, whether it be discussing a case and deciding uh, what imaging modality might be most useful for you to achieve a diagnosis, or if you need a hand evaluating some radiographs, then you can drop me a line either via email um, or give me a call at the clinic. So hopefully everyone has had a chance to review the four cases. Um, they've been available for the last week. Uh, one of the things we ask you guys to do is to write a radiology report for each of the cases. Um, we're going to use those reports to hopefully stimulate some discussion this evening. You don't need to spend too much time on the report, maybe 15 minutes, and the report should consist of a radiographic description using um, as many of the radiological buzzwords as you can think of and uh, some conclusions. So that should include a, a differential list and those differentials should be ranked and the rank should be justifiable and finally finish up by providing some recommendations. So if you feel like a patient might benefit further from a different imaging modality, say an ultrasound or a CT, then um, that's the time to mention it. So uh, for those of you who joined us last time, um, we tried something new. So um, in order to try and make these sessions interactive for everybody, uh, we're going to use the uh, Poll Everywhere software, which should allow everyone attending to take part. Uh, four cases means um, four people have a chance to contribute to the discussions, but using the online software, um, all of you guys can participate. So. Uh, we will be testing that in just a moment. Um, before that, we'll just uh, use uh, the time to go through an example. This is a case that uh, we reported last month. Um, it's a one-year-old female muted chihuahua that presented um, as a retching. Um, and I'm going to skip this a second. This is uh, the radiograph for the first case. Um, so we've got a single radiograph here. Um, it's a uh, right lateral thoracic radiograph. And in this film, we can see that there is a soft tissue opacity just also to the trachea at the level of the thoracic inlet. Um, there's some gas lucency surrounding this structure, uh, which would suggest that it's in the esophagus. And there's also some ventral displacement of the uh, trachea, um, which would suggest it's the space occupying. There's a little bit of gas uh, within the lumen of the thoracic esophagus and a lot of gas uh, within the gastric fundus. So this patient uh, had an esophageal foreign body, and it's just here, and uh, this foreign body was removed via endoscopy. And uh, that's, uh, that's the sort of description that we're looking for uh, with these cases. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll just see if the online software is working. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go back to this slide. So for all of you guys who would like to participate uh, via the Poll Everywhere software, I need to go to pollev.com, um, enter um, my username, which is Ian David Joni. Um, so there's, there's no uh, S, so Ian David Joni, 636. Um, and then when you see a question appear, then you need to respond. So if all of you guys who would like to take part um, using the online software can do that now, then what I'll do is um, I will activate the first question and you guys can start responding. Okay, so we've got a couple of responses. Let's 
just see if that'll sync up. Just see tab. Yeah, there we go. So we had four responses, and for those four people, it was working. So that is good news. So without further ado, we will move on to case number one, which is an 11-year-old female neutered English Springer Spaniel that presented as Coffin. So you've got three radiographs for you to have a look at. Uh, we have a right lateral, we've got a DV, and we've got a left lateral. So uh, before we delve into the online software, let's see if anybody is willing to have a crack at case number one. Anybody fancy presenting this case? Nobody feeling confident about case number one this evening. Who we got? Got quite a few people that have joined. Otherwise, if, if nobody is willing to present, what I could do is move straight to this. I can do it. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. okay. So there are three view on a skeletal mature dog. Uh, we can start uh, saying that this dog presents to uh, intercondylar pin or on bo in both elbow. Uh, yeah, yeah. And there are and there are signs of uh, osteophytes as well. Uh, then, if we move to the thorax, uh, if you go, can you go on the first view, please? Okay. Yeah. It's a much more. So there is a generalized diffuse of increased opacity with border effacement uh, of the heart. You can see in the dorsal, uh, uh, in the dorsal part, in the caudal lung lobe, uh, that there is a rounded soft tissue opacity. Yeah. That is also visible uh, on the on the left lateral. If you move on the left lateral. is more is well is better yeah, defined there is as well uh, in this mm, on this view uh, retraction of the lung parenchyma um, i would be concerned of some sort of like pleural effusion okay. if you go on the d d you can definitely see that there is uh, this rounded mass in the um, in the caudal uh, in the right caudal lung lobe yeah um so my main finding are uh, that this dog got uh, uh um, um a lung lobe a mass that is like in the right caudal lung lobe yeah. I would be concerned uh, of some pleural effusion because you can see some uh, um, retraction of the lung lobe. My main differential would be like uh, investigate and it would be like a pulmonary neoplasia, like carcinoma. Um, and uh, I would suggest uh, further investigation. They could be CT or... Uh, you can definitely try to sample an ultrasound guided and speak up. Okay. Yeah, no, very good. Um, so I absolutely agree with all of those findings. So um, there is indeed a relatively clearly marginated soft tissue opacity within the dorsocaudal thorax in both the right and the left lateral views. And in the DV view, uh, we can see this structure in the right caudal lung low and that's uh, certainly a worry um, could 
very well be um, a soft tissue mass associated with uh, primary pulmonary neoplastic lesion like a bronchiolar carcinoma. Um, I also agree that, that there is some effacement of the margins of the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm. Um, and there's also a little bit of retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, potentially a little pleural fissure line there. And in the left lateral view, there could be a little pleural fissure line just superimposed over the cardiac silhouette. Um, also some changes um, to the elbows. So as you pointed out, there are some screw implants um, through both of the humeral condyles and lots of aberrant bone associated with both of these elbow joints. So lots of um, very large osteophytes. So uh, certainly based on those findings, um, neoplasia is uh, high on the differential list. Um, but before we go any further, um, we're going to have a play around with Poll Everywhere again. Um, so I'm going to activate the next question. You guys should see it appear. Uh, for everyone who is participating, um, enter your answers now. So uh, what are you guys concerned about? So we've talked a little bit about there being a pulmonary mass, we've talked about a pleural effusion. Um, I'd be interested to know whether you guys were suspicious of um, a mediastinal mass, and, and if so, um, then are we concerned about all of the above? So is there a mediastinal mass and a pulmonary mass and some pleural effusion? So let's see what you guys think. So we have five people who participated. And most of you guys are concerned about all of the above. So a mediastinal mass, a pulmonary mass, um, and pleural effusion. And, and yeah, I, I would be inclined to agree. So all of those radiographic findings um, that we described earlier are, are absolutely correct. Um, so there is a pulmonary mass and there is some pleural effusion. Um, and we can be confident about that based on all of the radiographic features that we've already described. But there is something else going on here as well. So if we look at this DV view, we can see that the mediastinum here is, is really wide. So normally we'd expect these cranial lung lobes to extend cranially to the level of the thoracic inlet on both the right and the left. And, and here we've just got a uniform soft tissue opacity. And that's because there is something within this cranial mediastinum. So that mediastinum shouldn't be really very much wider than twice the width of a thoracic vertebra. So that's a big mediastinum. And if we look in the lateral views and we concentrate on the craniventral thorax, um, we can see again that there isn't really any lung tissue here. It's, it's just a uniform soft tissue opacity. And um, the appearance of the cranial mediastinum in the DV view um, would certainly support the existence of a big cranial mediastinal mass in these lateral views. So a cranial, a cranial mediastinal mass lesion would have exactly this appearance in the lateral views. So just a uniform soft tissue opacity in the cranial ventral thorax. And um, if we squint slightly, we can maybe convince ourselves that um, this trachea is just being displaced dorsally ever so slightly. So not only do we have uh, this clearly marginated large soft tissue opacity within the right caudal lung lobe. Um, also the pleural effusion as evidenced by the retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, the pleural fissure lines, which we can see in both the DV and also in the left lateral view. Um, but we've also got this cranial mediastinal mass here as well. So we've got this uniform soft tissue opacity in the craniventral thorax in the lateral views. And then we've got this wide mediastinum in the DV view um, with a uniform soft tissue opacity occupying that cranial thorax. And that's because there's, there's a big mass in this cranial mediastinum. Um, so yeah, nice job, uh, everyone. So um, this uh, patient um, had an ultrasound exam and the uh, vet was able to visualize lots of very large lymph nodes in this cranial mediastinum and also able to sample them and uh, the cytology on those lymph nodes was compatible with a lymphoma. Now, uh, certainly a large cranial mediastinal mass lymphoma would be on our differential list, um, as would uh, 
uh, thymoma as would ectopic thyroid carcinoma. Now, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see a large solitary soft tissue mass within the right caudal lung lobe uh, with uh, just lymphoma. Um, so we, unfortunately, we weren't able to sample this lesion here, so I can't tell you exactly what that was. But it's, it's possible that this patient had um, more than one thing going on. Um, but what I can tell you is that this, this cranial mediastinum um, is big because it's full of giant lymph nodes. Um, it's full of giant lymph nodes because unfortunately this patient has lymphoma. Um, so yeah, nice job everyone. Um, the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is that, that this, this is uh, a Springer spaniel, um, and Springer's um, tend to get uh, incomplete ossification of the humeral condyles, um, so they get uh, a fracture right through the middle of their humeral condyles, and um, as a result, they uh, can uh, need to have this sort of orthopedic repair, so a big screw just put right through the middle of the humeral condyles, and it's, it's often bilateral. So um, this, this patient had incomplete ossification of its humeral condyles, which have both been repaired surgically, which is why we've got these screws passing through both the right and left humeral condyle, and then a huge amount of um, osteoarthritic change associated with these implants. So yeah, the, uh, this, the screws were um, sort of a little, little cherry on the top, and, and uh, it gives me a chance to, to mention that condition, so incomplete ossification of the humeral condyles, if, if you guys have never heard of it. So nice job. Okay, let's move on to case number two, which is a six-month-old male neutered Yorkshire Terrier that's presented as vomiting. Um, you guys, I think, have got two views of this little doggy. So who fancies a go with this one? So B is, is essentially off the hook because she's uh, presented already. Um, so yeah, any of you guys fancy um, presenting case number two? So two views, it's a young dog, presented vomiting. If you guys are feeling very shy this evening, what we could potentially do is move straight on to the interactive part, which is this part. So I think that's what I'm going to do, is I'm just going to activate. This, so for those of you that are using Pearl Everywhere, you should now see this radiograph and you have an opportunity to click on the radiograph and demonstrate to me which area that you are most concerned about. So if those of you who are joining in via the poll everywhere would like to click on the image and let me know which bit you're concerned about, that would be fine. And a couple of people taking part. Fabulous. So let's just sync that up. Okay. So we had five of you guys respond, and we've got three arrows that are around the heart base, and then we've got two little arrows that are in the mid abdomen. Okay, so let's go back to these radiographs and have a little look, see what's going on. So if we start with the abdomen, so this uh, patient is, is very young, so only six months old, and the cirrhosal detail here is reasonably poor. Now, if this were an adult patient, we might be a little bit more concerned about that. So in um, an adult dog, um, loss of cirrhosal detail is compatible with uh, the accumulation of peritoneal effusion and or peritonitis. And in a patient that's presented as vomiting, uh, ruling uh, out a possible peritonitis and or peritoneal effusion is pretty important. And also uh, worth just having a look around the diaphragm between, 
between the liver and the diaphragm for any evidence of a new peritoneum. So this dog does have poor cirrhosal detail, but it's only six months old. And dogs that are very young and dogs that are very thin often have reduced peritoneal cirrhosal detail. So in this patient that's only six months old, the fact that we're struggling to really see any of the abdominal organs really, apart from those parts of the GI tract that are filled with gas, is probably down to the fact it's only six months old. So I'm not too concerned about that. This, this area here is going to be gas within the stomach, so this is going to be gas within the gastric fundus. We've got some uh, material within the stomach, it's, it's most likely just normal ingesta, has a very heterogeneous capacity, so it's permeated by these little focal areas of gas lucency. So in the mid-abdomen, um, we've got this uh, single loop of bowel that does look a lot larger than the other loops of bowel, but it is closely associated with the descending colon. So um, we can be pretty confident that this is the rectum here, so we can see some gas within the rectum, and we can follow it cranially, and it's, it's possible that it is contiguous with this loop of bowel, but it's not absolutely nailed on because there are a couple of other loops of bowel here that contain what looks like fecal material that might also represent large bowel. So we're suspicious that this is, is probably large bowel, um, but it's not absolutely nailed on. The rest of the GI tract actually looks okay, so um, we're not really seeing any other segments of bowel that could be um, dilated loops of small bowel. So let's move on to the DV view. So in the DV view, uh, actually, we can see that this is the colon here. So the colon, descending colon is on the left, and it's going to extend cranially, and become the transverse colon, and then we're going to get the ascending colon and the cecum. And a lot of this gas and this heterogeneous material um, all looks to be within the large bowel. So having looked at the DV view, I'm, I'm less concerned about that single segment of bowel that looks a lot larger than the adjacent loops of bowel. Chances are this, this is going to be large bowel. So the abdomen, we can't really see very much because it's a six-month-old dog, and this, this single loop of bowel that contains gas and is a little bit larger than the adjacent loops of bowel is, is probably just large bowel. So I'm reasonably happy with the abdomen. Now, uh, for those of you who think this little area here, that is something for us to be more concerned about. So this is a young dog. It's presented as vomiting. So if I look at the abdomen, we haven't really seen anything in the abdomen that we're too concerned about. The other thing that we need to check um, is the, the more cranial GI tract, so the esophagus. So the esophagus um, is going to run just adjacent to the trachea, it's going to run through the thoracic inlet and it's going to pass over the top of the heart base and then the cardiac sphincter is going to be just about here. And esophageal foreign bodies, they tend to get stuck at very uh, specific locations. So they can get stuck at the level of the thoracic inlet and the dog that we looked at as part of uh, the example earlier on had an esophageal foreign body that was stuck at the level of the thoracic inlet just in front of the heart and then just, just behind the heart. So this area here, at the level of the heart base, would, would be where we might expect a foreign body to get lodged. And if we look at the opacity of the structure here, um, it's, it's mostly soft tissue opacity, but, but there are parts of it that look a little bit mineralized. So if we compare the uh, cranial edge of this structure in terms of its radio opacity to the adjacent ribs, um, it, it's almost equivalent. So we've got this focal, reasonably clearly marginated soft tissue opacity at the level of the heart base, which is partially mineralized. We've also got a little bit of gas within the esophageal lumen, just cranial to this structure. And we've got very slight associated ventral displacement of the adjacent um, trachea and mainstem bronchi, just at the level of the bifurcation. So the question is, okay, we're, we're concerned that, that this could represent something within the esophagus. Can we see it in this view? And if we look at the DV view, and the esophagus and mediastinum are pretty tricky to see here because they're superimposed on the thoracic spine, but we can just sort of see the edges of, of the mediastinum just, 
just here. And they do look like they're, they're bulging laterally at the level of the heart base. And if we look at the thoracic vertebra, we, we can see them all pretty clearly. And they all look pretty normal, apart from this bit here, where we've got an, an extra bony structure that shouldn't really be there. And it's difficult to know exactly what the structure is. It certainly doesn't look like it's part of this patient's normal anatomy. So we can maybe assume that, that this is something foreign. And the fact that we've got a young dog that is retching, we've got a focal partially mineralized soft tissue opacity at the level of the heart base, which is a predilection site for esophageal foreign bodies. Um, we've got some gas within the what would assume to be esophageal lumen, just cranial to the structure. And then we've got associated widening of the mediastinum in that region. Um, again, an abnormal mineralized structure at the level of the heart base should mean that, that, that we're pretty confident that this patient has an esophageal form. And that was the answer um, in this case. So for those of you who popped your little arrows here, good job. So this was the bit to get concerned about. Um, so this is another predilection site for esophageal foreign bodies. So thoracic inlet, just in front of the heart, just behind the heart, the level of the heart base. So this is a little doggy that unfortunately had an esophageal foreign body. So yeah, nice job for those of you who participated with the pole everywhere. So this is case number three. Um, so this is a three month old domestic short haired cat um, that's presented as vomiting. So hopefully one of you guys is going to have a go at case number three. So I'm case. happy to have a go. Yeah, go for it. So we do have three radiographic projection of a skeletally immature cat. Um, the thoracic plus, plus they included the head. Um, we cannot see any alteration within the musculoskeletal structure. Um, I think the three projections have been taken different timing, as in the first uh, lateral possible, the right lateral. We can see a sort of rectangular um, shaped um, a rectangular shaped uh, amorphous, uh, like soft tissue, partially mineralized uh, material structure within the um, the esophageal, the cervical esophageal tract. Yeah, just just ventral at, at the cervical spine. Um, moving more caudal within essentially the the thorax, uh, we can see uh, a sort of uh, ovoid shaped. Um, Radiolucent, radiolucent area, which um, essentially presents some um, randomly distributed um, mineralized foci within, more in the ventral aspect. Uh, the same area is visible also in the DV projection, and it looks all, almost contoured by um, soft tissue. Um, soft tissue bands, soft tissue sort of capsule-like. Um, in the left lateral projection, we can, we can see that there is um, communication between this dilated structure uh, with, the, with the cranial part of the esophagus, because um, we can see a bit of gas in the cervical tract of the esophagus, and it looks uh, that the cervical tract of the esophagus that is in continuation with this dilated structure, which is uh, located in the cranial aspect of the um, of the thorax, essentially. The trachea is um, ventrally displaced, displaced, and in the DV projection is um, is displaced um, laterally on the right side. Um, we cannot see any, any abnormalities within the um, cardiac silhouette, and I cannot see any abnormalities as well um, within the abdominal structure included in the study. Uh, just the bladder looks uh, a, bit, uh, a bit dilated with uh, a bit distended essentially with, um, with normal content. So, um, Essentially, my conclusion are there is this structure within the cranial thorax which is dilated, 
um, possible the cat underwent to um, barium swallow study. That's the reason why we can see this mineralized um, structure and mineralized content within the cervical um, esophageal tract. And um, I, I think there is a sort of um, dilation of the um, cranial uh, proximal uh, thoracic um, aspect tract of the esophagus, which it may be compatible with uh, a sort of um, structure that um, from the external part is going to um, essentially um, is going to compress the esophagus. So I will go for um, a sort of um, vascular ring anomaly, like uh, persistence of the aortic arch and <coughs> or uh, persistence of the right uh, subclavia artery, although is less common. Yeah. Uh well, I think that was an excellent description. Um, so I don't really have anything to add um, at this point. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to open it up um, to the group and we're going to see what people think might be the most likely differential here. Um, so um, I don't, I'm not sure I could really improve at all on that radiographic description, but Based on all those findings, um, what does the group think? Do we think that this is uh, going to be a vascular ring anomaly? Um, is it something else? Is it an esophageal foreign body? We've had a couple of those this evening, so that, that could be the theme for the night. Um, is it something uh, like um, a megaesophagus? Um, we've talked a little bit about how big that cranial thoracic esophagus looks, or, or is it something else like maybe esophageal dysmotility disorder? Um, so yeah, let's see what you guys think might or might not be going. Yeah. All right, so we've got four people participating and everybody thinks it's a vascular ring anomaly. So that's that's pretty conclusive. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um so um as as we discussed, uh, we have got these these three radiographs. Um we have this this minimalized material and um, it's it's not barium so this cat uh, didn't have a barium study prior to these radiographs being acquired um this this is just sort of mineralized ingester that is just sat within the esophageal lumen almost a bit like kind of a gravel sign that you might get um, if you had a chronic um, partial obstruction um, within the small bowel. Um, probably wouldn't be appropriate to call it a gravel sign here because it, it's normally um, partial obstructions affecting the small bowel that you'd use. Um, that you'd see a gravel sign and you'd use that term, but, but similar similar kind of pathophysiology. Um, the, the cervical esophagus looks, looks big. Um, we've got similar um, gravelly looking mineralized material within the ventral part of the esophagus um, just cranial to the heart. As you pointed out, this, this esophagus just cranial to the heart looks looks really dilated. So we've got a, a focal dilation of the esophagus rather than a generalized dilation of the esophagus, which is what we might expect to see in a patient with um, a mega esophagus. Um, this, this doesn't really look like uh, an esophageal foreign body. So if you guys think back to the two esophageal foreign bodies that we've seen this evening, um, with those esophageal foreign bodies, we're not usually seeing this gravelly sort of mineralized opacity. We're seeing a focal increase in soft tissue opacity that, that in one case this evening was partially mineralized. Here, the, the predominant finding really is the fact that we've got this huge focal dilation of the esophagus and we've got this, this mineralized debris that's just settling in this um, grossly dilated esophageal lumen. And we can see it in, in this DV view as well. It's just here. So we've got this huge focal dilation of the esophagus, all of this mineralized gravelly ingested that's just accumulated within the dependent part of that focal esophageal dilatation. And as that esophagus has, has gone bigger, uh, as, as you pointed out, it's it's pushing this trachea over to the right and it's displacing the cardiac cilia cordially as well. So the only other thing that I might have mentioned here um, is this cat um, has been vomiting and regurgitating as a result of um, this disorder that it has. 
And in any patient that has chronic regurgitation or, um, or vomiting, uh, we need to watch out for things like aspiration pneumonia. Um, so uh, I might just open this up to the floor again and, and just see if you guys think that you can see any evidence of aspiration pneumonia here. I don't have a fancy pole everywhere set of questions for this. Let's just look at this right now. Any of you guys think that there's evidence of aspiration pneumonia? So aspiration pneumonia, typically it's going to affect the uh, right middle lung lobe, although it's, it's usually um, it's usually the cranial lobes or the right middle lung lobe. It tends to be ventral, so pneumonia um, is going to cause um, an increase in opacity and consolidation ventrally rather than dorsally and cordally. And the right middle lung lobe, usually uh, in a lateral V, you'll see it just superimposed over the cardiac ciliae. So uh, I, I think just here we can see a little embronchogram. So there's just a little uh, branching linear structure that has a gas lucency just superimposed over the cardiac ciliae there. So, so for me, I'd be concerned that that, that might represent a little air bronchogram. And, and if that is an air bronchogram, then that means there's some consolidation of that lung, be it the, uh, probably the left cranial um, lung lobe, um, or potentially it could be um, maybe the right cranial lung lobe. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an alveolar pattern because we can see an air bronchogram. Um, so I think there is some evidence of aspiration pneumonia here as well. Um, so in terms of uh, the top differential for me, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Uh, I think a vascular ring anomaly would be the top differential here. And uh, persistent right aortic arch would be the most common sort of um, vascular ring anomaly. And what happens with persistent right aortic arch is that you have um, the ligamentum arteriosum uh, between the pulmonary artery and the aorta that um, persists. And because the aorta is in the wrong place, um, the um, ligamentum arteriosum ends up sort of squashing the esophagus. So you've got this sort of focal stricture as a result of that persistent aortic arch and that ligamentum arteriosum. And as a result of that, um, you get this giant focal esophageal dilatation and then accumulation of ingester uh, within the esophageal ring. So um, I, I'm afraid that this, this patient was, was lost to follow up. So um, I, I can't tell you exactly what happened, um, but certainly for me, vascular ring anomaly and some evidence of, of aspiration in my as well. Um, so yeah, nice job. So anyone have any questions about case number three? All right, in which case we will move on to case number four, which is an eight-year-old domestic short hair cat that's presented as lethargic. So we've got a three-view thoracic study, essentially, for you guys to have a look at. So before we, we bring in the polls, anybody like to present this case? This is, this is more of a tricky one. So what I'll do I can have an undergo if you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there's so usually, to it. usually it's, it's kind of one case per session. But yeah, but... struggling, struggling for volunteers this evening. Um, so yeah, if, um, if you would like to have a pop at it, that would be, that would be great. Actually, you know what we're going to do? What we're going to do is um, I'm just going to open up the poll and we'll just let, let everybody uh, have a go at deciding where the abnormality is in this case. So I'm just going to activate just this last case. And you guys who are participating via poll everywhere should be able to see one of these radiographs now. And just like the previous case uh, with the esophageal foreign body, um, you just need to click on the area that you are concerned about. Oh, I've got a couple of people who are brave, brave enough to respond using poll everywhere. So let's, let's move on with this. Okay, I'm going to sync this up and see what 
you guys. Okay, so we had four people participate and three people were concerned that there might be something going on within the thorax and, and more specifically affecting the, the pulmonary vasculature. Um, so the uh, cranial lobar pulmonary arteries and we've got a little arrow pointing to um, the shoulders. Okay, that's interesting. All right, so let's go back to these radiographs. And yeah, if, uh, if you want, based on the results of our poll, um, yeah, if you'd like to, uh, yeah, give me your take on what's going on. Is, is there something going on with the pulmonary vascular chair? Um, or are we more concerned about what might be going on with the shoulder joints? And was, was, that, was that Nicoletta that we were chatting to? Was chatting to earlier. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, go for it. Mm, should I describe everything or should I just uh, explain why I pointed the shoulder? No, if, if it was you that pointed at the shoulder. So um, the, the little arrows are anonymous. So um, I okay. wasn't aware that it was you. Um, but yeah, yeah tell, me, tell, tell us why you pointed at the shoulder. So um, essentially we have this radiographic projection of a skeletal immature cat. Um, I think, uh, well, the, um, they're a bit uh, possible underexposed. Anyway, um, I mean, uh, I, I, I cannot really see any, I mean, um, in, within the thorax, uh, I think the, um, the lungs are well aerated. And um, the, the possible things is that the cardiac silhouette uh, is just within the two intercostal space and also the vessel they probably have a sort of reduce um, uh, reduce um, soft tissue um, op opacity details so possible the cat is a bit uh, dehydrated or is secondary to the exposure um, I can really, I mean, I'm, 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 if they are concerned about the pulmonary vessel, I can probably see them, they're a bit shrink, but uh, to be honest with you, I can really see uh, any alteration there. Regarding... Okay, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you should, don't let yourself be biased by, by the group. Yeah. <laughs> And regarding the shoulder, I think is the right, because you can see in the DV, there is a sort of, um, is, a, is a really subtle to mild periosteal reaction um, that essentially surrounding the, um, the proximal aspect of the right shoulder, uh, of, of essentially of the humerus, um, which, um, it, it's it's really difficult to see, but a possible um, um, is it, is a, a bit irregular periosteal rea reaction, sort of uh, possible speculated. Um, I can really um, appreciate any osteo osteolysis, uh, any mot eaten lysis within this region. Um, I, I can just appreciate a sort of uh, proliferative uh, newborn reaction. Okay. So, what would you like to do next? Uh, so, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we can do also an ultrasound of the zone. Um, we may probably have more uh, projection, more X-ray projection, just uh, focus on the shoulder. Yeah, no, uh, I think I, I think that's a great idea. So let's let's do that. Here we go. So that is a single medial-lateral view of this right shoulder. Um, so you're absolutely right to ping that right shoulder because that is is absolutely not normal. So. What are your thoughts on this right shoulder? 
Okay, so there is essentially there is a sort of um, mix between proliferative and uh, lytic uh, lesion. There are um, new uh, per, there is new periosteal uh, bone formation which is uh, palisading within the uh, proximal aspect of the of the right humerus. Um, just more caudally at it, we can see uh, a sort of radiolucency. Um, and together with um, yeah, a, a newborn proliferation, um, there is a, a sort of, uh, is, is a bit geographic, possible zone of transition and possible just, just caudal to the new periosteal formation. There is a thinning of the cortex it's just really subtle. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I would say as differential diagnosis possible um, to be a primary uh, bone tumor. Yeah. Which you, usually, the, I mean, the, in the 80% of the cases is the osteosarcoma and the other option, they can be fibrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and or hemangiosarcoma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, like, like your really rough description. So uh, now that we know which lesion, which, which area to be concerned about, it absolutely uh, was that, that right shoulder. And um, as, as you very correctly pointed out, you can see this raised irregular periosteal reaction on the cranial surface of this white proximal radius just here. Um, you can see uh, that in this DV view, uh, the bone looks abnormal in that area. So this, this, this lesion is real. We can see it in multiple views. Here it's, it's much harder to see. Uh, we get the impression that, again, there's an irregular periosteal reaction here and potentially um, some lysis. Um, then um, we can also see it in, in the other lateral views. So in both lateral views, this lesion is visible, mostly as just a raised irregular periosteal reaction. We get the impression that as well as that raised periosteal reaction, there could be some cortical lysis in this DV view um, and uh, certainly worth looking into. Um, we've also got this giant soft tissue swelling here as well. Um, so uh, in this case, um, the patient was actually having these thoracic radiographs uh, to check for pulmonary metastasis. So um, we were already aware that there was uh, something going on with this right shoulder. So um, it's a little bit of a cheat, but um, it does demonstrate that you really have to look closely at the periphery of the films to make sure that you don't miss any significant lesions. And here on the periphery affecting the right shoulder, we've got a lesion that could um, be potentially very significant. So zooming in on that right shoulder, since it's just a single medial view of that right shoulder, um, you're absolutely right. We've got this, this very irregular periosteal reaction. Um, which um, it does almost look a little bit speculated in places. Um, there is the suggestion that there could be some thinning of the adjacent cortex um, and um, the uh, zone of transition here, um, I think is, is pretty long and, um, and pretty indistinct. So um, in terms of describing the lysis, um, I think you uh, described it as geographic lysis. Um, so geographic um, would be a term that you might use for a lesion that, that was less likely to be aggressive. So geographic and then moth eaten and then permeative. Um, so, so here, um, the, the lysis, uh, it's, it's pretty subtle. And, and I agree that I probably only would describe it as uh, thinning of the cortex. And, and I'd be very suspicious that there was some cortical lysis here. Um, but the main finding is, is this periosteal reaction. This, this area here um, could represent um, a raised, some raised periosteum. Um, and if it is a raised periosteum, uh, then we might get away with using the term uh, Codman's triangle. So that's a term that you can use if you have an expansile lesion that is growing from inside of the bone. And as the lesion is expanding outwards, it's, it's lifting up that periosteum um, to give you a little triangle. Um, the triangle, the margins of the triangle representing the uh, margins of the adjacent cortex and the raised periosteum. Um, so all of these features um, are, as you said, 
very indicative of an aggressive bone lesion. So we've got uh, a very irregular periosteal reaction. We've got some evidence of cortical lysis. We've got a long indistinct zone transition. And that's, that's, those are all features um, of an aggressive bone lesion. The location of this lesion as well um, is, is a predilection site for um, bone tumors. Um, so it's the metaphyseal region of the proximal humerus. Um, so um, we're going away from the elbow towards the knee. So, so this is uh, this is an area that you, you would normally expect to see um, osteosarcomas. Um, and uh, yeah, we've also got a huge amount of, of soft tissue swelling here as well, or, or thickening of the soft tissues. So um, we've got a monoostotic aggressive bone lesion affecting the proximal metaphyseal area of the right humerus, um, and you provided some um, very uh, very appropriate differentials. So we've got osteosarcoma, um, we've got chondrosarcoma. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a primary bone lesion. It could potentially be a soft tissue lesion that's going into the bone, so it could be a fibrosarcoma. Um, but for me, I, I think I had, when I looked at these radiographs initially, something like a primary bone tumor, like an osteosarcoma, top of the differential list. So that was excellent. So we'll just take a quick look at the uh, CT of this cat um, before we finish. So this is a 1.25 millimeter post-contrast soft tissue reconstruction. And we're just going to have a look at um, the uh, forelimbs essentially, just to give you guys an idea of what this thing looked like on the CT and, and also how it looked grossly and, and, and how huge it was. So immediately, um, so at the start of the CT, we were at the level of the anti-breaking and we're moving cordially towards the shoulder joints. So here we've got the, the right shoulder and then here we've got the left shoulder that's just about to come up. And, and immediately you can see there's this, there's this huge soft tissue mass that is associated with this right shoulder. And this is a post-contrast sequence. Um, so um, we can see that this, this mass has demonstrated very strong peripheral enhancement and also very strong enhancement of the multiple internal septa that this, this mass has. So, so this, is, this, is a, this is a big old lesion. So I'm just going to run that on ever so slightly. And you guys can see more of those internal septa, that really strong peripheral enhancement. And now we're starting to get to the area where the bone is affected. So uh, this area just here is, is all of that irregular periosteal reaction that we can see on the radiographs. Um, this, this is the mass that essentially made up all of that soft tissue thickening that we can see on the radiographs as well. Um, so giant soft tissue mass and then all of this irregular periosteal reaction associated with that soft tissue mass. So we're going to on a little bit more. Again, we've got more aberrant bone just adjacent to this proximal right humerus. And that's that's that speculated periosteal reaction, which is that's a really nice example of, of just how spiky that periosteum has got as a result of this this mass lesion. Not only is this mass invading the bone, it's, it's invading lots of the muscle bellies of uh, this proximal right forelimb. So uh, it's probably within the, the tricep muscle, the infraspinatus and, and the supraspinatus. So this, uh, this little pussycat um, had this limb amputated, so no way that we were going to be able to remove this giant mass. And the, the final diagnosis here um, was a chondrosarcoma. So this was a chondrosarcoma in a pussycat and uh, presented as a really large soft tissue mass associated with the right shoulder. Lots of uh, evidence of uh, bony infiltration on the radiographs and um, multiple muscles uh, involved um, on the CT. So not something that we could try and remove. Um, so this, this pussycat ended up having this leg amputated. So yeah, nice job. Things to take away from this case, again, features of um, aggressive bone disease. So um, irregular periosteal reaction, evidence of cortical lysis, 
long indistinct um, zone of transition. And I mean, really, you only need to see um, one feature of uh, aggression to be suspicious that this lesion could be aggressive. And this lesion had uh, multiple features. So yeah, good job, team. Uh, so anybody have any questions about case number four before we wrap things up for the evening? Anybody have any questions about any of the cases from this evening? So we've had uh, a English Spring Spaniel with uh, lymphoma, so a big cranial mediastinum and uh, the lesion in its right caudal lung lobe. And we've had an esophageal farm body, a vascular ring anomaly, and we've had a cat with a giant chondrosarcoma affecting its right shoulder. Everybody happy with all those. In which case, um, I'm going to give you guys um, a little bit of news about uh, our next session. Uh, so um, next time, uh, we're going to have the session a little earlier. So the routine of these sessions happening once a month and happening usually, um, when it's not December, happening on the last Wednesday of every month, that will continue. Uh, but the sessions will move to a Wednesday morning rather than a Wednesday evening. So we're going to start running the sessions between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Uh, on a Wednesday morning. It will still be the last Wednesday of every month. Um, we're going to be joined by uh, all of uh, the Linnaeus interns. Um, so those guys are keen to get in on the action and to um, have, start having a look at some of these cases and contributing to these sessions. Um, so uh, next time, um, it will be the last Wednesday in January, but it will be uh, in the morning rather than in the evening, so between 8 and 9 a.m. Um, if you guys are not able to attend at that time, then as always, these lesions will be recorded and you can view them back using our website. Um, so, yeah. That is it for Film Reading 2020. Um, I hope that you all uh, enjoyed these sessions um, and you found them useful. And uh, yeah, we will continue to bring you interesting cases uh, next year. And um, I hope that you will join me and um, we can discuss them together. And uh, yeah, it just remains for me to say, a very Merry Christmas to everybody, and um, I hope that everybody stays safe and well, and I will see you all in the new year. So have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. No worries. Bye. Bye, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Have a good Christmas. Happy Christmas. <laughs>